Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be looking at FreeBSD 13.0 right after this. The FreeBSD Foundation released FreeBSD 13, uh, April the 14th. And uh, so I, I headed in my queue to, to look at it uh, because I have covered FreeBSD in the past and kind of want to keep up a little bit with this because like all other uh, major releases of FreeBSD, this one is not just a simple update. It is a major release and there are some major features that have been added to it. So I guess I guess the really big ones for today, the first one is is that ARM is now a tier one release. It means it's being done by the core team. And of course they have had ARM releases in the past, but it looks like in this particular release, they are including more mainstream ARM processors. Now what do I mean by that? So you have the Raspberry Pis, which are supported up through RP4, which would be the Raspberry Pi 4, as well as Pine 64, Pine 64 Pro, they do produce an ARM64 and an ARM32 bit. So ARM7 as well as ARM64 is supported. So whichever way you want to go there. The other major uh, change is that uh, it was ZFS. In the past, the FreeBSD team did the port for ZFS. This is now being handled by OpenZFS, the development team for that side. And to correspond to that, the versions of ZFS now on FreeBSD 13 is version 2.0, which is the merged ZFS uh, system between Linux and FreeBSD. As far as some of the other features and, and, and things that it offers, it's of course updated kernel. There's a lot of changes to the kernel. Most of it is to deprecate older stuff off that isn't being used, but they have provided some additional support for crypto uh, cryptography within the kernel. And then there's some changes to behave as well in order to make the VMs more I guess, easier to build out and be able to use. But there are some pretty significant changes to FreeBSD. So the major thing is that Clang and LLD, LLDB utilities, and some of the libraries have all been updated to the same version, 11.0.1. Uh, they removed the obsolete versions of the GNU debugger, and they've also removed bin utils from the system, those obsolete versions. And now they're supported. Now they have supported architectures that use the LLVM tool chain, which is that's if you're a developer, that's really good. One of the things that I saw that was kind of interesting is they removed support for CUCME out of the live alias. And I'm going to take a minute and talk about this because CUCME was the first video conferencing software that I recall. It was developed by Cornell University and then later became a commercial project by uh, White Pine Software. And it was actually licensed. It initially was released on Macintosh. I think it was like in 1992. And then um, they released a version for Windows about two years later, 1994, somewhere around in there. So you're talking machines uh, on the Macintosh platform that were PowerPC based. But on the Windows platform, and initially it was uh, i486, SX, and SL, I believe, were the two platforms that were supported. And later on, they then supported the Pentium versions of the uh, Intel processors as well. That's not, of course, the current Pentium. That's the original Pentium version, uh, and so which was a unicore processor. Uh, and... There's a, there was some it was let me just show you what it looked like it, it so the first thing you had was these ball cameras like this this is a the first one was announced by Kinetics and you plugged it into your parallel port you then used a a, a modem a dial up service over the internet so you had to use some you know some utilities under either Mac or you had to use the utilities under Windows in order to be able to connect your machine up to the internet. So this, this was in the days of, you know, 14.4 modems or 19.2 modems. So we're talking kilobits per second here, not megabits. So, or even gigabits. So these, these uh, ca cameras, like this one here, uh, was a 640 by 480 camera. It was black and white. And later on, they did, they did produce, I think Logitech produced one. 
a few years later that was actually a color version. I, I don't. I think Logitech bought Kinetics, but I'm not quite sure about that. It didn't have any focus mechanism, so it was kind of fixed originally. And it was the video. The video uh, was initially text, so you had t you had video, and then you had text entry. So you had to chat, and then they added audio later. I think it was added in '94 as well when they brought up the Windows side. So then you could actually talk to people. But to to give you some idea of what it looked like here, uh, let's see. Let's just go here, and then I'll, I'll zoom in here a little bit. It, we used to call it Blur Cam. Uh, and I got involved with this right up at the start uh, with it in about 92 or so. There was a number. You had to sign into what was called a reflector. And a reflector could hold up to, I think, 50 users, if I, memory serves me correctly. It was about 50. Of course, you know, things got a little silly after about 30 users because it got really hard, harder and harder to see who was actually you're talking to. But you can see the grayscaling on it isn't anything to write, write home about. The uh, uh, FPS rates, now that is optimistic that they're showing there. So I'm sus I suspect that's probably over a network. 15, uh, 17, 16 FPS. Yeah, no way. I mean, probably the the, the most I ever saw over dial-up was probably 5 or 8 <laughs> FPS. Not great. So people kind of jerked around when you saw it. And generally, it would adapt to your network uh, setting. So, yeah, it would try to blur out the image so it wasn't transmitting so much. It was. CUCME was the first software that did that. Uh, and uh, and like I said, it, it became a commercial product, and, and it lasted until probably sometime in the late 90s or so, maybe even into the years 2000, but there was a number of reflectors that were around the country, in, including one supported uh, by, by, by uh, the, some of the universities that actually used it for practical purposes, and that was to conduct remote classes. Uh, yeah, I just can't imagine how bad that was. There was a couple of TV stations that kind of experimented with it, but yeah, it uh, yeah, it kind of just didn't really take off. You know, it was fairly complicated to set up, and <laughs> yeah, and it usually wasn't very stable. I don't know how many times it crashed in the middle of a session, but yeah, it it it, it kind of was funny. And it, and if you had somebody that was you know trying to grief the channel then they, the admins would generally be able to get rid of them. But if you weren't an admin, all you usually had to do was just send a ping request to their IP address, which it displayed. And that usually was enough to knock them offline because just that extra amount of traffic, it was right at the edge, and just that extra amount of traffic was usually enough to terminate the connection. So, But, yeah, I used that for quite a while. I experimented with it because the doctors at the hospital I worked at at the time we're trying to experiment with patient and doctor uh, remote visits. So instead of having people having to come in, they could, they could you know, call the doctor and, and then they could conduct their session online. However, it wasn't very secure, and so that didn't go anywhere. <laughs> we didn't end up using it because it wasn't encrypted, it wasn't secure, People could listen in, and yeah, that just wasn't going to fly for a patient uh, and doctor conferences. So, yeah, we never bothered to use it. So, some of the other features uh, back to FreeBSD. Sorry for that digression, but I saw that being in here, and it kind of brought back memories, and I, I just wanted to share them with you uh, on some retro tech <laughs> from days gone by. Some of the experimental things that we did in the early days. So, uh, some of the other things that I mean, of course talked about ARM, and then and then we've talked about some of the drivers being ported for PowerPC. One of the things to remember about FreeBSD is a lot of the drivers that they get are from Linux. So uh, people, I've heard, heard people say that FreeBSD doesn't have a broad hardware support. Well, it doesn't have as broad a hardware support as Linux does, but it certainly tries to keep up with some of the latest hardware that is out there. And then they try to keep making room for it, unlike Linux, where they just keep piling on older and don't leave the older drivers out there. FreeBSD will clean up that stuff after a while and, and deprecate it and remove it from the kernel. Uh, I know there's drivers that are still in the Linux kernel that go back all the way to 94. So, yeah, <laughs> there's just stuff in there that just no longer is needed. But it, I, I think the fear is... There might be one person that's still out there using this old technology, and so they don't want to remove it. 
But FreeBSD is not quite that that way. Um, FreeBSD, of course, is Unix-like. It is not Linux. So it's it has a Linux layer, which allows you to run Linux code inside of BSD. So it is not a translator. It actually runs the code natively. So um, some of the other things are in the encryption support, like uh, TLS 1.3 is now supported, which is good. Uh, there is also some additional AES algorithms that have been deprecated and some which have been added. So, yeah, it's always good. And, and uh, one of the things that I thought was interesting is that KTSLS has been is, uh, is supported now. So, yeah, that's kind of interesting, um, at least from my standpoint, it's interesting. It, of course, FreeBSD supports an awfully large, as you can see here, a large a large base of platforms. Now, Risk Five. Um, I'm not sure that there's a 32-bit version of it. Uh, I suppose you could probably recompile it and get it to that. Most of the Risk Five processors that are around right now, uh, there are some that are 64, but they're not in the majority. There's most of them are 32-bit. So yeah, I don't know what you do in that instance if you happen to have one of those older Risk Five processors, but probably just recompile it and, and hope for the best. Um, There are three major uh, releases uh, or versions of the drop of the operating system. So you have DBD1. This one includes all of the distribution. So this has everything on it. Disk1 um, does not, if you do download that one, you can live run. You can run a live CD of FreeBSD, but you have to compile the packages. They're not included. Now the first thing we should do here is let me get back up to the top of the page and we'll go here probably the easiest way to do this is just right here and then it'll take you to the where you find the images so you'll notice this is the 13.0 release there is a version that's usually called current current is there where they are currently developing a new release and you'll see like if they start when they start 13.1 that though <laughs> that's a working build so they they're actually working on creating that release and they just it does nightly updates and and you can download those if you if you wish just realize they haven't been fully tested and you may run into bugs and crashes and all kinds of nasty things that you probably wouldn't want to do for a production environment but if it says release that means it has been fully vetted by the testing team and they are satisfied that it is ready for production so so and again, any new release, I wouldn't just jump and start replacing all my production servers if I was running 12.2. I wouldn't just jump in and start replacing everything, you know, without testing it first. You still want to do a controlled intro of a new operating system into your environment, so so you don't run into surprises about wow, this application doesn't work anymore, or this thing I was using is gone. It's not here. So yeah, not not pleasant to find out things that way. So I guess the first thing we probably want to do now, as you'll notice, one of the things is they're still calling this the i386, which is kind of obsolete. Uh, if you look at one of the changes they made in 13.0 is they used to refer to the architecture type as i386. So if you were to look in the uh, in the uh, uh, uname, you would see it listed as i386 if you were running the 32-bit mode. That has been updated. So in this release, it'll say I-686. So if you have scripts that are relying on this, you probably want to go and check that. Now, they probably should change this one too, but they're probably leaving it that way for people that, that aren't used to the change yet. So that would be my guess. So then you have a few choices here based on the type of download. And, of course, we'll want the disk one. Now, I've already done that. I don't need to do that again. So I'm going to I'm just going to uh, come over and start up Proxmox and I'll be right back. All right, let's get started here and I'm going to uh, create a VM and we'll call it. And I don't have a resource pool that I want to use, but I do have the ISO image mounted on a, a NAS drive, so I want that. Also over here, I'm gonna, it, I don't think this really matters, but 
you know, Linux might matter, so I'm going to change that to other. It'll figure it out, and I don't want to install this to Gluster. The rest of that looks pretty good. Uh, I'm going to give this four CPUs and 4096 because yeah, I probably should make this 8192. In fact, I think I am going to do that. I'm going to install ZFS, and if you install ZFS as your default file system, you should plan on about 8 gig at least uh, as a starting point. Now, as the arc grows, the, uh, the, the cache, as the cache grows, yeah, you'll probably have to adjust your memory up as you add files to your system. But 8 gig is usually a good starting point for ZFS. At least in my, in my humble opinion, it is. So I'm done here, and we'll go ahead and let it build out. You'll probably find you'll quickly be ratcheting up to 16 gig if you have any significant amount of files on your file system. So, yeah. All right, so let's get this started, and we'll go up to the console window. I'm going to go ahead and close this so you're not blinded by the white light. And I'm also going to scale this up so that you can see what I am doing. I hope. Let's see. There we go. So it's automatically started into multi-user mode, which it defaults to, which is what you need to install it with, by the way. Otherwise, if you go to single user, it'll just drop you to a command line, and you can do it all yourself manually. Uh, this is a C program. I think I've mentioned that before, that the installer in this case is not a shell script. It is actually a C program. So let me let me uh, and let me register the mouse, and we'll go ahead. Now it's telling me up here at the top my default is US. I'm not sure if it if it picks based on your location or whether or not it's just always US, and then you have to drag down through here to find if you're in a different country. But and then I'm going to call this. Now, you like I said before in previous videos, give this a a domain name of some kind and the reason for that is if you don't your system will not start and you'll be going hey what happened and the reason for that is there's a number of services that are keyed off of the domain name so just give it local or some nonsense it's okay so now you got some ch chance to actually pick what other components you want to install with this so uh, that looks fine to me I don't want ports um, you know, my days of compiling operating system code, I'll do it if I have to, but that's not my first choice. I'll add the 32-bit compatibility libraries. I'll leave that in there. Auto ZFS is what I want to do, and you have another other choices. You can go to the old Unix file system, your UFS, uh, if you prefer that oper that environment. Doesn't really matter. It's just my choice. I would rather use ZFS for this. And it, and it does say it does say right here to use ZFS with less than six gigabyte of RAM. Please go to that site and read about it, where they will try to talk you into actually going with more memory. So, which is not a bad idea, and you probably will go more than eight gig, like I said. Anyway, so all right, so this gives me a uh, a recap that it's going to be on a Stripe disk because it's a single drive. So I mean, you don't have mirroring, obviously. So you have to Stripe it because there's only one drive there. Um, now you can, if you have, if I went into the, if I went into the VM and created additional drives, then I could, I could obviously pick uh, a mirror or a RAID of some kind, depending upon how many drives I had available for it. But Stripe, no redundancy. This is fine. This is like committing suicide. Now here, if I hit the arrow keys, you'll notice it just toggles between the OK and the back. So spacebar will select it. If you don't select it, it'll just tell you you're missing a disk. So if you see that error message, this is why you got that. Uh, a last chance, are you sure? Yeah, if this was a, a uh, an actual real piece of hardware, yeah, you might want to pay attention to this. Make sure that what you are going to blow away is, is what you intend it to be, especially if you're on a system that has dual boot capability or you have uh, additional, you had older data that you're trying to preserve to move over here. So. Yeah, you might want to pay attention, but on on this particular in this particular case on a VM, it's a it's a drive that's being created as at the time of the install, so it's fine. This won't take a whole lot of time. This is pretty quick. Um, depends on the speed of the network and the file servers on the other end, but yeah, it doesn't take very long to do this. 
Actually, this is, I think, is actually extracting from the ISO, though. So that would depend more on your speed of your NAS. Okay, so it's done. So now it's asking me for a password for root. And it will ask you to retype it. And then it comes back and says, okay, so I found this network interface here. Do you want to use that one? Yes. Do I want to confer, configure it for IPv4? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Do you want DHCP? That's fine for now. I'll probably change it later. <clears throat> so it's going to get a DHCP. Now, do I want IPv6? No, not really. And then it just says, okay, this is what I found in your network config that came back from the DHCP server, and that's fine. And then the next step is to create your, to select your time zone. So I'm going to go to America, and then I'll have to go all the way down to the U.S. at the bottom alphabetic order all right so there it is right there and central time zone most areas is fine for me if you live in one of these states that does not observe um, it doesn't observe the time change if you're lucky enough to be in one of those then you might want to select that one so anyways asking me to confirm the date and the time and that's fine here I can check I can select some additional things if I want them uh, now I I don't need any of these things. I mean, I'm on a virtual machine, so adjusting things like the CPU frequency is probably not the smartest idea in the world. And and then some security features. So, if you know you're going to be running, uh, you're going to be running processes which are exposed to the internet, you may want to hide the user IDs so that the, the uh, and a potential attacker won't be able to see who actually is the owner of that application. Because if they see its root, then they know that. It's a potential that they could, uh, if they could exploit it, to gain privileged access to the system. You also have a number of, same thing with the GIDs as well. There's also, you can hide the processes that are running in jails, although I don't really find that all that useful since there are other ways that you can get that information. So, yeah. Uh, but anyway, so if you have specific security issues, then you might want to read through the manual and pick the one that's appropriate for your environment. So next thing, uh, do you want to add some users? Yeah, that'd probably be a good idea, since you should not as a... Now, there are times where you will have to run as root, uh, and, I'll, and we'll be into that in instance here. So you just, if you do have to run as a root user, then do it sparingly and do it only when you want to. So, All right, so it's asking me for my user ID. UID is zero. I'll just let it default. Let that default. Yes, I do. I do want to invite to wheel and to video. I think I can do both of them here. Yeah, I will check that. But the wheel is for if if you install sudo, it is not installed by default. But that will allow you then to control that this user has access to sudo. Video is used later for when I set up a desktop environment. This allows for video 3D acceleration to be enabled on that on the system. So, so that's why those two groups are being added. Login class, that's fine. Now, your home directory in FreeBSD defaults to slash home slash DJ where. That is actually a, a soft link that points over to slash user, USR, slash home. And that was the original location on, on Unix for where you stored your users. But as time has gone by, for some reason we decided to create a brand new root directory called home instead of having it where it really belongs, which is under user. But anyway, I'll leave I'll <laughs> leave empty for default. Yeah, that's now security-wise, you probably wouldn't want to do this because this is this is read write uh, for uh, the user, read write for the group, and then read only for the world. And you probably wouldn't want to do that in a production environment and if you're running Linus it will flag that it'll it, this default setting so user base password base yeah that's probably the way I want to do it ne empty no never do that <laughs> random now you could do this if you want the system to assign a random password I don't I want to do it myself And then I can, uh, if I'm if I'm administrating a system where I'm creating a number of users that are not currently on site, I might want to lock out the account after creation. But in my case, I'd like it to be enabled. <laughs> so is it uh, you get a chance to review everything, 
and it tells you this UI, UID will be 101, which is 1,000. Obviously, that was system assigned because I didn't do that. It is confirming that I did get all three groups, my user, my user group, which is the same as my user ID, wheel, which is sudo, and video, which is 3D acceleration. And my default shell is bin sh, which is fine for now. I may change that later. So it's added. Do I want to add another user? No. So now we come back to this uh, point, and this allows you to go back and modify any of the settings that you just did, with the exception of this. So if you want to install the FreeBSD handbook, and I'm going to do that. I just want the English version, which is the default. And we'll go ahead and install that. That way I've got a local copy of it here, and I don't have to keep going out to the internet for it. So if I do have a, a problem with the system and it's down, can't access the network, guess what? I'll have the documentation that I can go and read and figure it out. So, yeah. And another nice thing about this is you'll see that it actually is refreshing the packages as well as installing PKG. So this is all good. It gets, just gets all, all this stuff out of the way so that you would normally have to do. Uh, PKG is, is the package manager for FreeBSD. That is not installed by default. And so in this instance, it allows you to, by doing that install on the handbook, it shortcuts everything and it gets package installed, it gets the package libraries and, uh, and repositories set up, and then it installs the handbook. So you got all, thing, you got all three things going for you. So I'm done, I'm gonna exit. Now I can take one more chance here. If I have to go to a shell environment, maybe I have a driver I need to install that's special for my system. I got some hardware device there where the driver is not in the kernel that I have to install to get it supported. I can do that. Or maybe there's some additional things that I want to set up configuration wise before the first startup. But in my case, this is fine. I'm just going with the default, I'm not going to change anything. And then I'll reboot. And hopefully it'll come up. <laughs> Um, the thing to remember about FreeBSD is it does not install a default desktop environment by default. In fact, Xorg isn't even on the system. So what you're going to get is a server environment, which is typically text. You typically don't put uh, GUIs on servers. I have, unless you're Windows. Oh, did I say that? Uh, um yeah, it's just, I mean, it's just one, and especially X Windows, that is just, that's a pretty serious security vulnerability to have X Windows on a server that is exposed to the internet. I wouldn't do it. Um, you can if you want, but I wouldn't recommend it. So the first thing I'm going to do is, let's see, check my groups, make sure those look good, and I do have wheel and I do have video. So I am all set up and ready to go for anything I might want to do in the future. So the first thing I want to do is to su, because I can't do anything, there is no sudo, if I do sudo, it's not here. So instead I'm going to switch user to, and I use a dash because if you don't use that, it won't read the if you have profiles set up, it won't read the root profile to enable any any environmental variables that you that you want to be able to be able to access applications that are not in your default locations, for example. All right, so let's, since we don't have to do anything else, okay, so we're all up to date. There's nothing to do here. The next step for me, well, let's just check. H top here, no. Uh, oh, I, I guess I probably ought to do a search on glances because if I remember right, there was two versions of glances on the last in the last time I reviewed uh, FreeBSD. So, yeah, and they used the Python version. Yeah, it still does. I, I, well, I guess I mean that's that's good that they do that because uh, yeah, I'm sure there'll be a version of Python somewhere down the line that's greater than three seven. So, all right, so. I know I need this, and I need, I need Python 37 glances. Now, I don't have to put in the version number. It'll figure that out. Package is a little bit like APT. The command structure is very similar uh, to APT. So if, you're used, if you've done any kind of Debian-based distribution, you probably and you've done it from the command line, you're probably familiar with package already. Um, so 
Yeah. I, the only thing that's different is to be aware of is when you remove packages, the dependencies don't automatically come off like they do under Debian. So there are command options you have to include in order to do that. So anyway, um, let's see. What else do I want? I want get. I guess I'll, I'll get NeoFetch. I don't know why, but I'll do it. And, and I'll, it's, it's ready to go. 243 meg. That's good. <clears throat> the other thing I want to before I actually jump in here the other thing while well, this is installing uh, the other thing I want to make sure of is I want to look at the version of ZFS and see what and just confirm that it is indeed 2.0 I mean I don't doubt them I just I'm just for my own curiosity I always want to validate and make sure that that is the case I'll probably look at a few other things too but let's look at let's just start down through the list so the kernel build was April the 9th and as I mentioned this the official release of this was five days later so yeah that's which is good and that's now I have been running some commands so 602 meg that's not bad but it is kind of high for a text only but let me show you why that is let me bring up top here before you jump and say wow that's a pig it's it's not actually it's actually if you look here it's only actually using 15 meg of memory um, but 286 meg is being used by the arc and then there's a number of, um, there's a, quite a bit of memory that's being held back for cash. So, so yeah, yeah, so you've got, you've got quite a bit going on here. So this is nice because this tells you what ZFS is consuming as well. Now, I, I'm not quite sure what these mean. I guess that's something I'll need to go study. I'm not going to speculate as to what these all mean, but um, this one I know for sure is the total of the cash for ZFS. So let's just take a look. Let's do a zpool version and see what we actually are running. So, yep, 2.0. Yep, 2.0. And let's see what we got declared here. They have divided up my single drive and given me back about 28.9 or 29.5, of which I'll get it eventually. Uh, 28.2 gig is available. And I just have, of course, the one drive, which is what I set up. I can do a ZFS list. And that'll show me the build out for the the uh, for all of the volumes and all of the data sets under ZFS. So or pools, if you prefer pools and data sets. So uh, looks like it's fairly this is very very standard and it's very similar to the way uh, it was done under 12.2 as well but uh, yeah let's uh, the other thing I want to do is look and see what is being soft linked so right now home is soft linked to user home and sys is also uh, soft linked to user source sys so those were that was fairly common uh, that this that the sys directory was always under there and, I suppose they have done that for compatibility because Linux, for some reason, decided that home should be out in the root directory, which I disagree with. But um, but that's I'm, I'll just get off my lawn, you know. That's just the way it is. So, <laughs> all right. Next thing, let's look at let's let's see how bad this is. I'm going to reboot this. Uh, reboot. I guess it doesn't want no. It doesn't want a time value. All right, fine. I'll just reboot it. I want to clean up and make sure that I have, you know, I don't have any stuff that I have created caches for by doing installs and all that stuff before I look at what the base memory looks like. So that's the reason why I'm doing this. Okay. Old habits, you know. Don't see any error messages either. That's good. So the, the, the startup was clean. Let's take a look. 127 meg. So the arc hasn't built up yet. 
So that's probably a better view of what the actual overhead of the system is. And that's not bad. I mean, I've seen worse. Let's take a look at top and see what the ARC, yeah, the ARC hasn't built up yet. It's only at 33 meg. And the cache hasn't built up either. So, which was, I think, at 800 last time we looked at it. So a lot of this stuff, if you're looking at the memory usage uh, when you're running ZFS, is that, it's, yeah, it's all caching that's going on. Which is good. That's performance. Um, let's look at glances. See what the actual is. 435 meg with the app caches included in the count. Now that'll go up. Trust me. That'll go way up. Overhead on the system without anything running is very low. It's, it's less than 10. A, a, <laughs> it's less than 0.1%. Somewhere in there. So yeah, it's nothing. Okay, so the next thing I want to do here is get back in root. And I want to do a package install on RK Hunter. And the reason why I'm doing this is because, well, I'm going to put Linus on here, and Linus is going to look for this, whether I want it or not. It's just going to do this. All right, so RK Hunter update is the first thing I want to do to make sure that I pick up any latest changes to the mirror and then we'll do an RK. I'm going to go ahead and run it just to make sure it works and so that my, my, my the tac tac check is actually going out and looking at the system to see if there's any issues security wise that RK Hunter finds including any potential for rootkits. Now I've had people on my channel telling me before there's no such thing as rootkits on Linux uh, actually, there is, and I have seen them. I have seen them appear on servers. I have seen them appear on Solaris uh, so as well, and they come in the form of a USB stick. The other thing, and there, there are Linux rootkits uh, that will exploit your system if you allow it to. The other thing to be worried about is if you are running a file share that is, is using, uh, that allows Windows clients or Mac clients, you have a potential vulnerability to install software that has a rootkit ready to be installed on those platforms. And all you're doing with your server is becoming a vector for that rootkit to propagate through your system. So that's the other reason why I hunt and look for rootkits. So I hope that explanation helps you. I hope that helps why I do it. So this is looking right now, it's looking for any kind of differential between the last time it was run and any potential changes to software that is basic, like your utilities. That would be an indication that the system has been modified in some way. Now, as soon as, of course, I do an update and the package gets replaced and that the utility becomes uh, invalidated as far as the signature that Rootkit wrote initially, then it's going to mark it as being flagged and then you'll have to check as to why. So that's always a good thing to see. Uh, and now it's going through and looking at the rest of the system to see what other goofy things that I've done wrong. So I have a, you see right here, it says the commands check failed. And that's because it knows that the signatures for prop update uh, have not been updated yet, but there, it didn't find anything else. So that's good. And all you do to update the signature is to do a prop update. And then it will then uh, rebuild the uh, signature file that it uses to identify any changes to any of its key files that it looks for. Now if I rerun this, I'm going to go ahead and do it. I'll I'll pause it. You don't need to watch this again and then uh, I'll show you the result. Okay, it's finished and it, now you can see that the file properties check is blank. So it didn't find any issues because the the file is now current on the system and so we have a, a clean run. That's good. So the next thing I want to do is a git clone. Oh dear. I don't think I need the git. I think it'll just, yeah. I think it'll work without it. Let's try that again. All right. <clears throat> Yeah, so I kind of need to be able to do this, and I'll expand this up a bit for your benefit. 
Okay, let's see what we got. Overall rating 58. Yeah, it's, it's probably found the UID problem. So let me just go up to the top and work our way down. Multiple users with UID zero found in the password file. Yeah, it doesn't like that. That's a no-no. Um, also, there's accounts found with the same UID, which probably might be a cascade from that one. Don't know. We'd have to look at the password file. Unprotected council. Yeah, they, they didn't go like that. And package audit. Let's see what's going on there. It's suggesting that the, the vulnerability database is unavailable. So let's see. Package audit. And I believe a minus F will do that. All right. So yeah, we do have a CVE vulnerability for curl. Uh, not sure what the, let's see, does it tell me? doesn't tell me the severity. I'd have to go look it up. But, yeah, we do have a, we do have a vulnerability. It says automatic refer leaks credentials. That's probably not going to be, that's probably not going to be a, a low rating. That's probably going to be fairly, more, fairly high up. So, yeah, we've got that to take care of. And let's see what other issues we have. Uh, UUCP. Yeah, this is, you probably should get rid of this. You use, unless, are you guys still using dial up to uh, get your news feeds from UUCP? Uh, <laughs> UUCP was how you copied files from one system to another. And if you were running Usenet, that was the most common way to update Usenet. So back in the day. Uh, anyway, home is not separated out. And it wants VAR to be pushed out as well. We need a firewall. We need external logging, process accounting. We need an NNT. We need an NTP daemon. Now I could have fixed that problem by when I did the install. I had the chance to install an NTP, and I didn't. So for this though, I don't. You know, for for what I'm doing, I don't need that. And then we've got some permissions and ownership issues. We need sys control values set, and we can come back up here and we can look at those. Oh yeah, there's a lot of them. They're different. So in this case, it'll show you, so this is the value, and this is in your syscontrol.config in Etsy. So it'll say, this is what it's expecting. And then you can, you can look at what it has, if it does have it set. Yeah, there's quite a few of them, isn't there, that need to be worked on. So, and that will clear that error. And then what else? Arden compilers. Yeah, not going to do that. I'm not going to let root do my compiling. Sorry. I, don't, I never have agreed with that one. Um, let's see. The I guess the first thing we need to do here is go edit. I'm going to get out of this directory, though. I need to go edit my FS tab. What I want to do is, like last time, I installed a desktop environment, so I kind of want to do that again. And... Read right. I think that's right. The problem is, by default, you need that in order for the debus to be enabled. And so that's why I'm doing this. And, and <laughs> yeah, you will need to do that. So uh, I'm going to do a package install on Xorg, and that will take a while. So I will be back. This is the base X Windows install. Step one. Okay, that's done, and that did take a few minutes. Uh, but anyway, that's okay. You only do it once. I now need to, uh, next thing I need to do, I am going to put GNOME out here. I did try KDE again, and it failed, <clears throat> just like last time. So we're going to try this. I have not tried GNOME. I, this, could, this could fail, and that's fine. Whatever it does, it does. I have a, this is going to take longer because it's bigger. I'll be back. Okay, so that finally got done, and the next thing I want to do, which I've already taken care of while I was waiting, but I will show you. So there's a resource control uh, called rc.config, and what you have to do is, if you'll notice here, I added a comment right here that shows what I did. So I have to enable the dbus. I have to enable the, the GNOME uh, DM, which is, of course, your login page, and then this is the GNOME itself. So the desktop manager, the GNOME itself, and then hopefully it'll come up. <laughs> I, again, I haven't tested this. I don't know. Uh, I guess this is kind of one of those things where we will find out. 
and I'll watch it over here because this is where the GUI will actually come up. Until I install some software to make it remotely come up, but right now, that's the only place where it'll be visible. The pensive weight. <laughs> And hopefully it'll switch. Uh, that looks good. Let's see what happens now. Don't see my mouse moving though. That is disturbing. I think I'm missing something. Yeah, my mouse down here is just kind of hung. It's kind of sitting there. So <laughs> I'm obviously missing something and so I will I will declare this a fail for now. Hi, future uh, DJ Ware here. So the problem with GNOME was actually uh, the VM. So I was using the default uh, way of managing the screen, and apparently it doesn't pick up the mouse. So as you can see, now it is. I'm using uh, Spice, and... I will go ahead and register my mouse, and then, as you can see, it's all working. So that was a pretty easy fix. So let's go. Let's go look around at some of the things that are in here. And we do have, uh, we do have some wallpaper that we can pick. And of course, there is more that you can download. This is just what comes with it. Let's look at about. See what we got here. So. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm running under KVM. It's using the LVM pipe. 34.4 gig, 64-bit, and then the known version is 3.38.2, which is, I guess, okay. Let's see if I can... Nope, can't do much with that. Not without installing some additional drivers, would be my guess, to get that working. But, yeah, I do, <laughs> yeah, this does seem to work. Um, let's see if I can reorder. Yeah, I can drop. And there should be a terminal here somewhere. I want to add that to my favorites. <clears throat> Hmm, that's interesting. I haven't seen that problem in a while. What do you think I am? X term. Let's try that. That did it. So yeah, it was just the default font that was the problem. That looks a lot better. Usually that's a pro, you know, yeah, so it is a bug probably in, the, in what the default settings are for the terminal window are incorrect. Sometimes they set this to courier and courier sometimes has a problem. But yeah, it looks better. It looks a lot better. Um, the only thing I didn't do yet is this. Now that's showing a different GNOME version than what this is displaying, isn't it? Three thirty four dot four, and this is showing three thirty six dot six. Obviously, they're not reading from the same spot, and that's the same space. So. So, FreeBSD 13.0, I like the fact that ZFS is now at 2.0 because that does bring compatibility with Linux. And so I like that. I like the fact that it also has a tier one support for ARM devices. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to experiment on, the, on actually ARM hardware. I do have 
a Raspberry Pi 400 sitting there that's not doing anything. So I think probably the best thing to do with that is to bring it up and give it a try since it's already got a keyboard and a mouse and all that. Uh, <clears throat> as far as FreeBSD is concerned, <clears throat> the only packages it comes with are the base utilities that come with Unix. So everything you have to install, you're basically going to customize this just like you would an Arch install to get exactly what you need done. Now, hope you enjoyed this today. Uh, please like and subscribe and hope to see you again. I am going to be doing Friday videos. I'm going to bring those back. Uh, probably going to do, it's probably going to be, I think IT stories is what I'm planning on doing. Since I think a lot of people enjoy those goofy things that happened during my career uh, or some of the funny moments <laughs> in my career. Also, I will include the things that have embarrassed me over those over the, my career as well. There's a number of those as well. So I'll let you in on that secret as, 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 too. Hope you enjoyed this. Please like and subscribe and bye for now.